issue. So why Russian internet is different uh, from uh, uh, the situation in the global internet, I would say that we have uh, lots of initiatives to, uh, which are aimed at oppressing uh, internet freedoms, but few of them have passed so far, fortunately, and some of them that, that have passed uh, are not exactly uh, being implemented or don't exactly have mechanisms to be implemented. We don't have many foreign brands on uh, Russian internet, as you may know. We don't have Amazon, we don't have eBay. Facebook doesn't have a, a representative office here, uh, just one person. Um, and, uh, but instead, we have uh, very uh, many power powerful local brands, such as Yandex and Mail.ru. And both of the, uh, those two brands uh, are considered among the most powerful in Europe um, due to the recent IPOs that both companies went, went on. Um, and one, uh, uh, one paradox, uh, which, is, which, which I find very interesting on the Russian internet, is that um, Russian internet has, uh, until very recently, been marginalized. Uh, it's uh, in, in, in a perception of local officials, of uh, uh, more or less local public. Um, it's been a part of several companies, several blogs, several uh, well, businesses uh, which have uh, um, been more or less concentrated on their own. And recently, uh, Russian, Russian web has started to sort of spill out and conquer other spheres, uh, previously unusual for it. For instance, uh, the notion of internet economy has very recently been introduced um, to, to the officials and they, they have recently discovered this as a novelty for, the, for, for themselves. And um, uh, Google has uh, conducted a research together with Boston Consulting Group to assess the uh, volume of internet economy, which is a relatively new um, sort of notion. And uh, um, we realized that Russian, uh, that Russian internet economy in 2009 accounted for 1.6% of the GDP which is uh, and 2.1% of the GDP is excluding oil economy and factors which are linked to the oil economy. And basically this is more or less close to Italy <coughs> or Spain. So it's, uh, um, it's a very interesting uh, figure. But let me speak of another uh, very powerful trend on, on, on the Russian internet, which is uh, the copyright reform and the trend uh, the dimension where copyright reform is now uh, taking. Um, we, until very recently, uh, talks with the local rights holders and the Western rights holders who are represented in Russia have uh, mainly focused on, uh, on, the, on the dilemma of whether internet is good or bad, uh, whether internet should be shut down as, as, as such, uh, or should be sort of kept alive. Um, it's, it's, it's just changing as we speak, if I may. And uh, rights holders are now realizing that internet is actually giving them uh, an additional revenue instead of um, stealing their markets. Um, and I'm mainly now talking of um, movie production companies uh, and uh, to, a less, to a less extent of uh, uh, publishing houses. So what, what does internet give to rights holders globally and in the, in, uh, in, in the Russian situation, particular, particular to the uh, Russian environment. Um, authors, um, including professional uh, content industry and uh, uh, users, can certainly use internet to promote themselves. And they have much lower costs when they start promoting themselves online as compared to the offline situation. Um, think of YouTube, which uh, didn't exist only six years ago. YouTube has now an audience of uh, 600 million people worldwide, and we have um, uh, we have more than 27 million uh, unique viewers per month in Russia, and this number is growing very fast. And we now have 48 hours of content uploaded to YouTube every minute. It's more uh, than if you if you think 
think of it comparatively, it's more than um, Hollywood uh, production studios uh, show over a year. So basically, it's quite a, quite a big figure. And uh, the number of uploaded videos in Russia and from Russia have uh, increased by uh, 145% over the, over the last year. Um, we very much cherish the fact that uh, um, a conventional user, a user like us, like, like you and I, uh, can actually um, become as famous as professional, uh, professional uh, as a conventional professional, let's say. And we have beautiful examples in the West, such as Justin Bieber. We have much fewer of them in uh, Russia, but also quite impressive, such as uh, Peter Nalich. Or we have uh, uh, bloggers who have uh, um, also proven that they can conquer uh, um, and actually collect over 300, uh, 3 million views uh, and subscribers, such as Marina Nova, who is a very uh, famous virtual teacher online um, and has a, an, an interesting uh, blog on YouTube. Um, interestingly, increase in, uh, uh, in these figures and changing uh, of, of, of the situation uh, and the fact that we have much more of the UGC, user-generated content on uh, YouTube, for instance, than, than we have um, in, in terms of professional content, is directly linked to the success that monetization is currently making, that the monetization uh, <coughs> uh, parity is, is, is currently making. Uh, by chasing the partners consulting figures, advertising online in 2010 um, was reached $18 million or 2.4% uh, of the overall uh, advert online advertising market. And they forecast <coughs> this figure to be $36 million in 2011, by the result of 2011. And by 2016, um, this, this company predicts 12% uh, $180 million. So uh, rights holders as well as conventional bloggers, conventional users are quickly um, um, adapting to these uh, logics of uh, advertising online and actually earning on their content. And this is how it, 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 it works on the example of YouTube. We currently have uh, over uh, 20,000 uh, 20, uh, partners on YouTube worldwide. Um, which are using our uh, partner program, Content IT, and are um, uh, monetizing their videos. And we have 70 partners in Russia, and just less than a year ago, we only had one. Um, 65 or 67 <coughs> think, uh, out of these partners are monetizing their content. And these are Russian studios, uh, so, uh, Russian uh, broadcasting, and <coughs> production studios <coughs> such as uh, Basilevs and SDB, which are actually, actually quite a, a curious example. Basilevs is owned by Timur Rukmanbeta, who is also famous in Hollywood and is uh, quite a distinguished uh, film director in Russia. Um, he used to be one of the most um, resistant and persistent opponents to internet uh, as a paradigm until very recently. Um, we have uh, uh, Moss Film, uh, the um, legendary Soviet film production studio, well, Soviet and then Russian, um, which is one of the rare examples of um, uploading their full length films online. And we don't have many of those examples worldwide. We do have them, but not many. And Moss Film, um, well, negotiations have lasted for a couple of months. We have been persuading them. And now they are using a technology which I'm going to say. Uh, the technology of protecting their content online, and uh, they are free to actually show everything they have, uh, and their users are very proud of that and uh, um, are welcoming this, this experiment heartily. Um, another interesting trend is that uh, all the musical studios, all the musical labels, musical record studios that we have in our partner program in Russia, such as uh, the Eating Records, the Nat Info Center, Gala Records, etc. They are monetizing uh, copies of their uh, videos and of their music. Copies, which
which are found on um, other users' channels, um, which until recently we would call pirates, right? So they're monetizing those pirated copies, um, and it's proving, um, well, uh, very popular, and it's proving to uh, increase their revenues instead of increase their losses, as they would say probably a year ago. Um, we think that this is changing. Oh, sorry, yeah, I don't have uh, uh, much time, so I'll wrap up quickly. We we have uh, uh, these very interesting um, trends and change of philosophy in the attitude towards uh, pirate content. Um, apart from YouTube, obviously, we do have uh, um, several, um, as we call them, new digital distribution modules in Russia, um, such as Twiggle, uh, Zumbi. We don't have iTunes, we don't have Hulu, but we have local alternatives. And uh, um, to uh, wrap it up, we are currently lobbying for, as the, as the internet industry, and Brett's holders are uh, joining in, fortunately, we lobby for a local um, adaptive version of DMCA, because we don't have it in Russia, we don't have uh, uh, legal protection for professional content uh, online. Um, and we think that by introducing DMCA-like principle, uh, which would introduce intermediary uh, uh, liability exceptions, yet with responsibility coming upon notice, um, we would uh, all contribute to uh, advancing and fostering of these uh, innovative platforms, and would actually help rights holders to um, adapt and change their business models and flourish together with the users. Thank you, and sorry for being uh, that eloquent. Thank you. Um, we have some time. I'd like to open it up to any questions from um, from the audience for any of the speakers who want to get questions in, in even short. If there's another microphone around. Use this one. Okay, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one uh, for the I think his name is uh, Chulu Part actually in uh, uh, this round. And also the first one is about Pauline and about uh, this research is because um, uh, last year when we read uh, my Russian of Blogosphere, there was a question uh, about uh, blog and uh, now at uh, present not just for IT specialists but for ordinary people. I mean that, uh, as you know, uh, Blogosphere peaked uh, six years ago and after this uh, we can see a clear decline. And uh, I think it was uh, last week, even in Russian uh, radio, there was uh, also a report on live journal saying that uh, there is a big decrease in uh, this firm. So, uh, and as you know, uh, most of the users, they are going to the social net and uh, like Jenjet, the social net in China and Contacti, social net for Russia, um, I think these users are, uh, so we can use bots and, uh, for example, Russian speaking uh, coders uh, to work with this content. So I'm interested uh, for the uh, future prospect for such researchers, because uh, you know it's a rather difficult question. And the second uh, question about uh, IPR and this protection, uh, because uh, there was many words and right words, but in, for example, in Russia there is very popular this book uh, Free Culture by Lacey. It was translated uh, into Russian, and uh, now you can read it freely on the internet. And it's a very important question about uh, how to kill creativeness, and especially what is this, this is a good example of uh, China Telephone. As I remember uh, last autumn, there was a big campaign by Chinese government uh, to protect uh, um, intellectual property. So about in a month after it started, there was official who reported like this. That yes, IP protection is very important for us, but it's also very important not to damage uh, this uh, innovative, um, innovative movement uh, that we can see uh, among our, our contract producers. So I would like to know some comments about uh, this issue of intellectual property. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, why don't we collect one or two other questions if there are some others and then bring it back to the panel. Sure. Uh, I have a big question for the people from the Marquand Center. You talked about briefly the, the agenda on uh, the impact of internet on politics. I was wondering if you can tell something more about the main lines that are being developed in that sense and what exactly brings her to the, uh, the center are you currently working Thank you. Here, right here. I also had a question for the Berkman Center about data and whether any of the blog mapping data and characterizations that you showed here, uh, how and in what ways might they be available for research? And last one up front. Suppose I could do a short documentary, five minute documentary that uses like 30 second uh, footage from some, you know, Hollywood stuff, something like that. Um, and then the studio asks you to take it down or whatever they do. So do you just take it down or do you ever negotiate a fee maybe to protect the, you know, the content? And then uh, you get into these kinds of negotiations and you know, protect you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll uh, jump, uh, Rob, jump in whenever you want to. Okay, so the question of uh, are fewer people blogging, and does that, uh, as I understood, does that um, mean that blogs are not important in a sense? So generally, this is the same thing that's been said in the U.S. that blogs are no longer popular and there aren't millions of people on them. And I think just I would just say that I think it is a bad a bad measure of the impact of any technology is how many people are using it. Um, but I, I think it is generally true that. With the, all of these technologies, they also become sort of uh, media superstars. So right now it's Twitter, and it's, and it's Facebook, and it's Contactia. And they're getting ton, huge numbers of people uh, joining, and then they're sort of leveling off. Um, I will just say, uh, potentially, that uh, what may happen with blog journals is what happened in the US with blogs, which is, for a long time, we had a, a huge increase. And then, actually, over the last few years, there's been a pretty stable amount, which is about 10% of American internet users uh, are actively blogging, which is relatively small compared to something like Facebook. Um, but it is actually, uh, when I think about it, it's 10% of the population is actually talking about, um, not always, but in many cases, involved in a international or sort of a uh, public conversation uh, that would be very hard to have before. So, um, but you also raised another question which is connected to another one on uh, other platforms and how do we study, study other platforms. Um, uh, what we're doing right now is we're actually uh, we're doing a project that's looking at Russia, and it's, it's, it's wrapping up right now, but we are trying to understand this space within the broader media ecology, and as well as on the other platforms. So part of the reason we're doing the Twitter research is that now that we've done this type of methodology on blogs, we can apply it to, to Twitter and see how it's similar or different. I showed a couple of those uh, explanations. Another thing we're doing is we're actually collecting data. We're doing a really, as opposed to social network analysis, we're doing more uh, content analysis on Russian TV, uh, Russian government websites, um, again, uh, the most thousand popular blogs uh, in Russia, as well as some of the blog clusters that we showed here, um, and um, I forget what you guys said. So it's, and then we compare actually how uh, different topics are discussed on different platforms, um, and, the, but, and then just a final point on uh, things like social networks. They're a huge part of the space. Um, but unfortunately for uh, academics and researchers, it's very hard to, due to privacy concerns, to study this space. So I'll just leave it as an open challenge and something that um, I think we need to consider, consider to think hard about and how do we get, not necessarily access to that data, but how do we understand how people are using these uh, types of social networks and understand their impact. Sure, I'll just uh, tie along a, a little bit. So there's there's a few other things that we're, we're working on. They're still in their infancy. So um, we're starting a project to look at the political changes in North Africa and Middle East. We're going to be applying the techniques that we've learned in other places, so studying blogosphere and Twitter as well. We're, we're also looking at doing more survey research to understand how individuals interact with different platforms and different networks in becoming politically involved. It's, there's obviously, it's, it's a huge amount of research. said about 
facts is that there's obviously a lot going on there, and we're just in a very poor position to be able to study that because of the constraints that we're under as a research institution. We need to pass all of our research through review boards, and this is just a big question mark for us. I'm afraid that we're probably going to be in a position where a lot of other people with less stringent research standards are going to be able to do better research in that space than we are because of where we exist, which is unfortunate for us, but others will do that work for us. If I understood the question, it was to do with balancing the need for greater creativity with the need to protect the rights of rights holders. I would strongly recommend reading the Media Piracy Report by Joe Karaganis. There are two interesting pieces of research in that report or associated with that report and linked to the blog. The first is research from Hungary by Bodo Balas, which talks about how pirate networks serve as better archives than state archives for Hungarian film. So that is very interesting research. And the second research from China, and I don't know the name of the researcher, but she demonstrates she demonstrates that the first phase of the fight between the pirates and the rights holders was purely on price point. Both of them were trying to provide the same movie for the cheapest price, but the second phase of the war is now on quality and how the pirates in China now do much more in terms of serving the fans' interest than the actual rights holder. To give you a simple example, if you are a fan of Prince, for example, and you try to buy the whole discography of Prince, that's impossible to even produce as a legal product because Prince worked with so many different music studios. The only place that will give you the complete discography of Prince is Pirate Bay. So the pirates are clearly serving up better quality than the rights holders. The last thing, a story about books from India, and this is about John Gardner. People usually think that the James Bond novels are written by Ian Fleming, but it was a franchise Ian. John Gardner produced as many James Bond novels as Ian Fleming. Uh, and uh, he also did many other novels and series. And in Indian law, there is an exception, uh, a, compl a statutory license. It states that if a translation is not produced in Indian languages within five or ten years, then you can approach the copyright registrar and produce uh, translations and the government will decide what royalty you need to pay to the rights holder. So a Gujarati translator called Ashwini Bhatt, uh, thanks to his publisher, translated three books in the John Gardner series, not the James Bond, the other series. They were a big hit in Gujarat and the public came back to Ashwini Bhatt and the publisher and said, where's the fourth book in the series? But John Gardner had died and there was no fourth book. But Ashwini Bhatt said, I have already translated three books, I know how to write the fourth book. And he wrote the fourth book. <laughs> and it said, uh, whatever the title was, a novel by John Gardner, translated by Ashwini Bhatt. So, uh, indeed, uh, to protect uh, uh, creativity, one will have to rethink uh, the contents of uh, the current IP regime. Answering to your specific question, um, this is how DMCA, uh, what was known as Zaydan regime, works on YouTube. Um, it's purely up to the rights holder. If the rights holder wants to take it down, um, he can take it down, or he or she, uh, the, the company can take it down. Sends us a notice um, and chooses for instance to block uh, a part of your video. Uh, a part of your video can be blocked, either a sound for soundtrack. Uh, if it's claimed by a rights holder, it can be blocked. However, um, <coughs> we notify you as a user who uploaded this video of this wish uh, of the rights holder uh, the video to remain blocked. We block it immediately uh, first. Then we notify you and you have a right to the counter notice. If you claim that this, this uh, is either fair use 
for is a home video and you uh, actually own the rights to it. Uh, or you have other reasons to actually protest. Um, you send us a counter notice and then we tie you up with the rights holder who claimed the rights for this video. Um, and uh, we take further steps uh, according, uh, well, uh, only upon the uh, court notice uh, afterwards. Meaning we are acting as a mail service, basically directing and redirecting this correspondence This is a most sort of fair system which has uh, been invented by the uh, American uh, law in the first place and uh, um, exists on, uh, also on, on, um, in some different uh, legal regimes as well, uh, including Europe. Uh, we don't have uh, it in Russia currently, although uh, YouTube uh, follows the American uh, law in this regard and we would uh, take down uh, in all regardless of the jurisdiction, regardless of where we are. Um, uh, as for the question of whether we do negotiate or not, we are not a court instance here. We, we, we do not judge whether it's uh, rightful or not rightful uh, for you to claim, you know, that this video must be in a various uh, regime. However, we do have a database of uh, songs, for instance, that we buy off from the rights holders, it's legal, and it's free to use on YouTube. Um, well, yeah, I should probably stop, stop here to, to, to leave room for questions. Okay. Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, the economists <laughs> are, um, are, are back in, in, in the room, and we do have to give them their, their conference back. Um, so I wanted to thank all of you, and thank you very much. We've heard a lot of things. Um, uh, from a global perspective that are relevant and it's not very familiar in Russia, we've heard about um, having more questions than answers uh, in terms of the empirics. We've heard about having more uh, rhetoric than evidence in terms of policy making. We've heard about having more uh, criminal liability than civil adjudication in terms of, of law. Um, and I think that that's a challenge to all of us uh, here, whether we're in policy analysis or whether we're uh, thinking about how to, to develop and apply. Uh, models of, of, of behavior and economic interaction and, and policy uh, impact. Uh, so as I said, this is the first public event of the Center for New Media Society here in, uh, in, in Moscow, but there's a lot more uh, to talk about. I would, uh, in thanking all of the panelists, also encourage you to find them uh, later through the, uh, the coffee breaks and, and, and in the hallways, uh, but we do want this to be uh, an open source and collaborative uh, and creative uh, endeavor moving forward. Um, so thank you for your time.